you, good friend. Hello. Welcome to The Revealing. I'm your host, Pavarotti, here to discuss the Idaho 4 case. As a disclaimer, this channel is for entertainment purposes. These are my opinions. I'm not here to slander anyone. So let's get started. First of all, I'm looking forward to moving on in this case. And I want to send a shout out to my guy, Harsh. Harsh, you the man. Thank you for the videos that you did. Thank you for all the videos. Every, every time you bring me up, Harsh, you know I appreciate it. I also want to send a shout out to AR. Watched your video, man. Spot on. I think you did great. I think you're, I think you're thinking the right thoughts as well. I agree. Um, as far as my reaction video, I mean, folks, if you watched my video on Mr. Kopaka, at the end of it, I said, if a content creator makes a video and it's not flattering, I'm going to make one back. I literally said that in the video. So, you know, I, I'm, I got to stay firm to my word. But I want to discuss just a couple of things because I'm, I'm working on some things and I'm, I'm going to get a video out to you soon. It's going to be, first it'll be the members only, then I'll release it to the public. But I'm still hard in the middle of an investigation on what I'm going to be discussing because it's getting serious. On a light note, though, I was thinking about, obviously, the case. You know, it's always on our minds. And you know how when you go out and you buy a car, you never see those those cars on the road. But if you go out and you buy one, every car that drives by you from that point look as, as the car that you just bought. All of a sudden, you see them everywhere. You know, it happens every time, if you, if you know what I'm talking about. It's just weird. Well, it's kind of like that when you're deep diving into this case. You know, things you would never know, normally notice, all of a sudden you notice everything. For example, you know, I did a video last week or a few days ago about Howard Bloom and how I felt about his book that was coming out. Well, we were watching a special on Hulu. You know, I grew up in the 80s. So back in the 80s, that's when I feel like all the good movies were. And, you know, <laughs> there was several really good movies and there were for the younger folks and, and it was movies like, um, you know, like The Breakfast Club, um, you know, like The, the Outsiders, then you got uh, St. Elmo's Fire, you know, all those same kind of actors, they kept popping up in different really popular, pretty dang good movies. Well, then all of a sudden they got branded the Brat Pack. Okay, and y'all may remember that when they were branded the Brat Pack. And it was certain actors that were branded in this Brat Pack. And I remember that from the 80s. Never thought too much about it. But then we were watching a documentary on Hulu. And it was Andrew McCarthy who was, you know, one of those members of that Brat Pack. And, you know, a lot of those actors you never really seen in movies after that. And I never thought about it for, you know, 30 years now. Turns out that them being branded the Brat Pack pretty much ended several of their careers. And, you know, they've been obviously um, thinking about that for 30 years. And where that Brat Pack came from is why I'm talking about this is a writer. A writer wrote a story about these actors and he branded them the Brat Pack and absolutely destroyed their careers. If you watch that documentary, it's the documentary that basically the whole documentary is about this story that this writer had written about them and he called it the Brat Pack and how it destroyed their careers. They even have an interview in this documentary between Andrew McCarthy, the actor, and the guy who actually wrote that story. And the reason I'm bringing this up is the guy who wrote that story worked for the New York Times, and it was a guy named Date David Bloom. And I went, whoa, David Bloom? Yeah, this Bloom, these Bloom uh, people, must that must be their, you know, the, the family name as, as they write things that that go out and destroy other people's lives with, with no, uh, 
you know, no regard for it. Now, I don't know if David Bloom and Howard Bloom are related in any way, but they're both named Bloom. They're both writers. I mean, they could be. But if my point is, when you buy that car and then all of a sudden you see all these other cars on the road, pretty soon everything you see seems to have, you know, seems to have some type of correlation to, to what you're focusing on, which is, in this case, this case. But anyway, that was a pretty cool documentary. If you like movies from the 80s, you remember the Brat Pack, and you have Hulu. Hey, that's a good documentary you can watch this weekend. I enjoyed it. But I want to show you what I'm working on right now. Okay? I'm deep diving, as I always do. And this deep dive is I'm trying to go as far as I possibly can. Because you know it's my contention that there is an informant in this case. I actually feel like there are a couple of informants. You know, TF, I believe, was the initial informant, but I believe he was utilized by the FBI to go down a different path and take out different individuals, as I've suggested. All right, the Aryan Brotherhood traffic drug trafficking network that was taken down in March of 2023. I believe he was an integral part of that. So I think he was an informant in this case initially, And then the FBI plucked him out, put him in the program, and had him work on taking that other organization down. That's my speculation. And then I believe it was his partner in crime, TR, that the Latal County is utilizing in the court case against Mr. Koberger as an informant. And it's also my contention that those two blatantly set up Mr. Koberger and Mr. Kopaka. And I'll get into more of that in detail later on. But here's what I wanted to show you. Because, you know, finding stuff out like I'm talking about is not easy. And I'll show you how I'm deep diving to try to do it. I'm getting close. I'm getting close. I'm not there yet, but I'm getting close. All right, take a look. Okay, so here's what I'm working on now. You can see this is the FJC, Federal judicial center and i'm in the court database and i'm trying to do is i'm trying to find some records on a informant who has an indictment but a federal indictment and they're probably not going to list too much about them because it's going to be a sealed federal indictment so what i've done is you can see here there's about 50 trillion configurations you can do on this thing it's very i've been spending a lot of time on it All right, so you got the Ninth Circuit Court we've established over here, and then that's in the District of Idaho. So those two things are set. We're going to leave the nature of the offense, the disposition empty, because there's, again, 5,000 trillion uh, configurations. But in the nature of the proceeding, we're going to go through and we're going to find sealed indictment, because that would be the one that I think that would pertain the most. And then down here, we're going to go through and set all of these, which is could change everything if you set one different. But we're going to go through greater than the preceding date of 2022 and less than 2024 on the termination date. And then all this other stuff here to try to narrow down our search. And when we do that, we narrow down our search to these individuals right here. Okay, now remember this is in Idaho and the Ninth Circuit. These are sealed federal indictments, all right? So this is the federal cases. And then to narrow these down, what do we do? We go through preceding dates. 2007, no. 11, no. 11, 9 of 2022? Uh, you know, that, that could be a possibility there. I'll look deeper into that one. 6, 13 of 2023? Possibly. It's in the time frame. Uh, 222 of 2023. Now, wait a minute. Now, that one that one lines up date-wise because the AB were taken down in March of 2023. This is February, towards the end of February. All right, so this one, this one is looking interesting right there. We'll dive into it a little bit more. Uh, 06, 12. The only other one is this one. Now, look, this one right here. Now, you know when I seen this, I freaked out. 12, 14, 2022 and went, oh, my goodness. I think I got them. And then we view the record. 
And of course, it's not going to give us their name because it's a sealed indictment. But there's other information on here that allows you to investigate further. Okay, so the thing that I go down to is what kind of crime is this sealed indictment? And I find out right here under filing offense, the code is 9001. Say, so, okay, so we got to figure out, is that related to our case? Is this our guy? 9001, where is it? What kind of offense is that in this trillions of laws they have for the feds? Okay, 9901, no, that's a civil rights violation. That can't be it. Where are we at here? Boy, my eyes, my eyes, my eyes. Here we go, 9001, hazardous waste treatment disposal store. Dang it. All right, so that was not it. Well, let's eliminate that one from the list and go back to the one that that looks suspicious before that. And that was on, where was it? Well, let's see. Let's try this again. I went back. You know what? I went back, didn't I? Here we go. All right, the two... 22 of 2023. Now, what is this one all about? View. Sealed indictment doesn't give me his name, but preceding date, 2-22 of 23, that correlates. Let's go down here to uh, the date loaded, load date, March 7th, 2023. Uh-oh, so we're getting... We're within 20 days of the drug trafficking organization getting taken down on this one. So this one's starting to look promising, but what is the, what is the crime? What is the crime? All right, this, the crime for this one is 6801 filing offense. Code 2, AO filing offense, D2 file. They're both 6801, okay? What do we got here? 6801, what is that? 68, 6801, okay. Controlled substance sell, distribute, or dispense. Ooh, that one we need to look into a little further. Okay, so there you have it. And, you know, folks, I'm diving into that hard because it's important to this case. Very important to this case. Everything that I've discussed is very important to this case at this point. And I'm not the only one who thinks that, okay? I'll just I'll tell you a, a, quick, uh, a quick story here. When you dive into these court docs and you really focus in on them, you'll notice a lot of things at the very beginning that are telling. Now, I always had, I always had confidence in those Steve G texts. If you watched my past videos where I dive into the Steve G text, you'll, you'll see that I always felt that they had merit. And the reason I say that is when you go back and you look at the original documents in this case, you'll see there was a lot of stir from the Gonzalez family and Shannon Gray, their attorney, actually pushing for things to happen in this case. But the really odd one is when you look at the affidavit for the prosecutor, Bill Thompson. And you know, when you see on these affidavits, it always starts with, I'm, you know, like for the officers, I've been an officer for 12 years. I've done this, I've done that. You know, Bill Thompson's affidavit is very simple. It's like three little statements. I may put it up on here, you know, in a future video, but it just says, I'm Bill Thompson, been the prosecutor for 30 years, prosecuting this case. I will call as a witness, the Gonzalez and the Gonzalez family in this case. Signed, Bill Thompson. So, you know, that's really weird. Why would your affidavit 
talking about yourself, you know, being a signed prosecutor, why would it mention how the Gonzalez family is going to be witnesses in this case? Just strange. And nothing else. That's all, it's, that's all it says. I just, I just thought that was really interesting. So that's why I think that, you know, Mr. Steve, I mean, I, I figure why it's there is Mr. Steve actually did his own investigation in the beginning of this case, hired some investigators, and I think he found out some things. I think he knows some things, and I think the prosecution knows that he knows some things. And when I think of that, I think, well, what would an investigator that he hired actually find? And I believe he would have gone in the route that I've gone. So I don't think it would have taken him too long to reach somebody like TF and TR. And I think that's why in one of his texts that says, the FBI told me to stay away from that one. That one's protected. You'll get in trouble if you go any further after that one. See, that's, that's why I'm focusing in so hard on this aspect. Because I think it's a known fact. And I hope that Ann Taylor knows that fact. Because while I would think that everything's made been made available to her in this case, I'm not so sure anymore. I think they could be hiding some really pertinent facts like that. And they just don't know. Because there's not a whole lot of them on that defense investigation team. And they've got a lot of discovery to go through and analyze so when you get in the weeds on things and you're going through all that discovery, trying to figure out what they have and what they don't have, it probably doesn't leave a whole lot of time for thinking outside of the box on what they're not giving you, especially if it's things like we're talking about. So that's why I'm deep diving into the federal indictment on who the informant is. Because this is the other thing that I haven't mentioned, and it's going to come up in my timeline series here pretty soon, is if I'm correct, and TF and TR are the informants, and they did set up Mr. Koberger, well, let me tell you, they didn't just run into that courthouse, grab the prosecutor, and say, hey, we want to turn ourselves in. We know all about the uh, atrocity and, uh, the, you know, these are the guys that did it. And, you know, this was our involvement. I mean, that wouldn't happen. Okay, they're not stupid. Those, those, those folks are criminals, career criminals. They're not stupid. That would only happen if they were implicated. Would they bring up the patsy and put his name in it? They wouldn't run in there and just give up the name. So something happened between the time that TF was picked up, transferred back to Latal, and the time that he was transferred over to Judge John Judge's court and given the deal of the century. Something happened. He didn't just he didn't tell on them and give the information to get his drug charges reduced. Somebody implica somebody implicated TF and TR. Somebody implicated them in some way. And that's why they gave up who they gave up to save their own skin. And that enabled the FBI to come in and snatch him up, put the pressure on him to go after the big boys. Okay, now that's my speculation. The other part of my speculation is who gave up TF and TR? Not who gave up Copaca and Coburger. Who gave up TF and TR? Now, do y'all remember at the beginning of this thing where it was said that they found a schematic, a drawing of the home at 1122 King Road? They found it outside and they logged it into evidence. Now, I'm going to be doing a video on that one here soon as well because if that's a fact that eliminates a whole lot of people from contention in this case but anyway I said that's just a whole lot of talk a whole lot of talk on Pavarotti's part um, you notice that I did figure out the microphone thing 
the Echo, one of my subscribers pointed that out, and I appreciate it. I had two microphones on, didn't even know it. So got that fixed. Uh, I got to get a better camera, obviously, if I'm going to use this format because you can't see my ugly mug as well with this camera that I currently have. But until I do, please like and subscribe to the channel. Post your comments, post your criticisms, post your thoughts. Um, <laughs> this from the racks and stacks, it's the best on wax. How about another double 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 show? Sounds in from KMAC in Washington in Moscow, Moscow, Idaho. No, I'm just kidding. Pavarotti is out. <laughs>